All right, so we're in our third of a five-week sermon series called Sun Stand Still. And this is based on the prayer that uh, Joshua once prayed. Joshua and his armies, they had uh, crossed the Jordan River. They were fighting the armies that had, had uh, inhabited the land of Israel. And Joshua and his, uh, his crew were winning. There was an upset that was going on. And, and Joshua wanted to finish what he started. Um, you know, pretty good, above average, wasn't good enough for him. Uh, he wanted to win. He wanted to win that day. So he prayed this audacious prayer with his audacious faith. And he prayed that the sun would stop. He said, sun, stand still. And God stopped the sun. And Joshua's army won. And the people of Israel got to inhabit uh, the promised land that God had promised them for so many years. One of the things we've been looking at is that big prayers lead to a big life. You know, we're all interested in having a big life. And one of the ways to achieve that is through big prayers. You know, uh, we believe that big faith uh, leads to a big life. You know, we believe that big dreams and, and big visions lead to a big, wi- to a big life. <laughs> I almost said a big wife. <laughs> that would have been a disaster, not that it already is now, so. Just want to see if it... <laughs> All right, we're here to start a three-week series on... <laughs> okay, so I have a 10-year-old son, Benjamin, and when he, this is about five years ago. He was... Uh, I cannot believe I said that. Um, I can't even blame that one on my dyslexia because I wasn't reading. I was just, like, thinking, you know. And, okay, so I have a 10-year-old son, uh, Benjamin, and five years ago, he had a vision. And his vision was uh, that he was going <clears> to <throat> take this little bike out of our garage and... He was going to put these uh, elbow pads on, and he was going to ride down the street, and he was going to do it without the help of uh, the train wheels, and he was going to do it without the help of his dad. Now, this was a vision. Now, <clears throat> remember the last few weeks, we've looked at uh, what vision is. You know, God's vision, or let's talk about specifically biblical vision. Biblical vision is God's preferred picture of our future. Okay, so we've been challenged over the last few weeks to, to to develop that uh, vision in our life. You know, God's preferred picture of our future. Now, Benjamin's preferred picture of his future was that he was going to be able to ride this bike. Now, there's a problem. Um, You know, you just don't hop on a bike and ride it. You have to learn how to do that. Now, most of us, I mean, it'd be rare that any of us can do this by ourselves. So to Benjamin, this vision was improbable and impossible. Now, it doesn't mean that it couldn't be done because it had been done by many people before. In fact, most of us in this room have learned how to ride a bike. But to him as a five-year-old who had limited time on a bicycle, this vision was improbable and almost impossible. Now, as his parent, as a loving parent, I wanted to see him succeed in this vision. So I helped him, uh, I helped him do this. Uh, I was there. Yeah, I wasn't going to let him fall. I, I ran behind him, and you know, we have this little parking lot across the street from our house at a, a swimming pool, and I'd run behind him, and I'd, I'd hold the seat, and he would pedal, and he would start to balance. And then I would let go of the seat once in a while, and then when he would wobble, uh, do you think I'd let him fall? You know, show him some tough love? No, I would, uh, I would grab the seat, and I would straighten him back out. And in this parking lot, there's a, a curb that's about a foot high that uh, protects the swimming pool from the parking lot. And there was times when his bike would start to veer over to the curb, and it's his loving parent. I'm not going to let him run into the curb. You know, and then uh, Benjamin developed a little bit more confidence, and he thought, you know, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. And he was wrong. He wasn't doing it. I was helping him do it. Um, you know, but I, I kept doing it, and then one day he started doing a little bit more, and then one day it just clicked. And the boy was able to ride the bike by himself without his parent. Now, the vision had come true. What was once impossible and improbable to him became possible and probable and likely, and it actually happened because of the love and the patience of a parent. Now, you know, five years later, Benjamin's got a different bike now. Um, you know, and, and sometimes riding the bike still isn't the easiest thing to do. We live in a very hilly neighborhood. And sometimes when he rides the bikes up, uh, ride the bike up the big hill, the hills become a little bit too much. You know, there's been some uh, scrapes and some bruises uh, since he first learned how to ride that bike. And sometimes, you know, he just gets a little bit too tired and the bike gets, uh, the bike gets put away. Now still, uh, it was audacious faith. It was a vision that he had that, that, that uh, came true. And what this does, is it simply shows us that through audacious faith, that the vision that we have in our life can come true through the love of a heavenly parent. 
Now, this is a common theme that is illustrated throughout Scripture. God gives, and remember back to the first week, we talked about, I said, when God gives you a vision, this vision is going to be so big that you're not going to be able to achieve it by yourself. If you can achieve something by yourself, then it's not a vision from God. It's just something that you should do. You know, God's vision for our life is going to be so big that we can't do this by ourselves. You know, and when we get in over our head, guess what? God is going to pull us up. When we veer off in the wrong direction, guess what? God is going to correct our path. Uh, when we're about ready to fall, you know, God is going to, uh, God is going to prevent that. Um, now remember, I want you to listen to these two things. God's vision or God's will in our life will never take us where God's grace and God's love and God's power will not sustain us. We've said it the last two weeks. I'm going to say it again today. God's uh, vision, you know, when God gives us the vision, there is always going to be provision. I want to, I want to tell you a story. Um, this story happened uh, 31 years ago. I was a 10-year-old boy, and um, my brother is uh, eight years older than me. Now, my brother, you, wouldn't, you could look at me and my brother, and you wouldn't even know that we got the same mother. Uh, you know, Scott is uh, six feet, four inches tall, uh, easily weighs 300 pounds. He's just a big, strong guy. You know, my dad is like 6'3". My mom's like 4'11", so our family pictures are like this, you know. And uh, I love my brother now, and he loves me, but uh, I used to antagonize him, and uh, he used to have a response to my antagonism. And one time, uh, Scott was uh, just walking down the little hallway in our house, and I, I tripped him, and he fell over, and I thought it was funny, and I laughed. He didn't think it was funny, so he started to chase me. Um, now, there's some things you need to know about my brother and I. I'm faster, I'm smarter, I'm better looking. Um, <laughs> he is bigger, and he's stronger. So I ran out this door as fast as I could, and he chased me as fast as he could. And I knew if I could just get away from the first 50 or 60 yards, that was going to be fine until he got his hands on me at a later date. And we have one of those split rail fences at our house. And mom still has it at her house. Uh, it's one of those, the first one's like a foot off the ground and it's like this little uh, four by four piece of cedar. And then it's kind of like goes into the pole, a little hole there. And then there's another one on the top. It's like about three feet tall or so. And, and I jumped over that fence like I was running the steeplechase or something like that. And he was fouling me and he tried to jump over the fence and he didn't and his uh, big six foot four frame broke the fence. Now, I thought this was very amusing, and I laughed. I was like, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> then all of a sudden, I felt these uh, two great big hands underneath my armpits, and it was Scott's best friend, John Murray. <laughs> 31 years later, I'm still sore from, <clears throat> from the beating that I took that day. My ribs still hurt. My thigh still has a bru bruise on it. You know, if it were socially acceptable, I, I'd lift up my shirt and show you where my rib, uh, you know, is still broken from that incident. You know, and uh, uh, the people of Israel, they had been there before. Yeah, they, they escaped out of Egypt, and um, they went across the desert, and they, they went to this uh, river. Now, I want you to picture the Missouri River this summer. Did you go downtown? Did you see the river, how high it was, and how fast it was flowing? You know, that's what they were looking at. This river that just was not crossable. There was no pedestrian bridge. You know, There's no way to get across. Now, as they looked behind them, um, they saw Pharaoh's army closing in on them. Now, this is kind of like the United States military fighting Paraguay or Uruguay or something like that. They were outmatched and they would have surely died. Now, they looked at the river and they knew that option number one is if they would stay on the side of the river, they would be killed by the Egyptian army. They knew if they tried to cross the river, they would drown. Now I want to ask you this. Um, can you imagine what they must have been feeling? The terror, the anxiety, the confusion, the fear? Now the answer is yes, you can imagine what they are feeling because you've been there before. In our vernacular in 2011, we call it being between a rock and a hard place. We call it something like uh, our back is against the wall. Now Joshua clung on to the vision that God had given him, that he was going to enter into the promised land. 
Joshua never stopped believing in God. Now, I want you to listen to uh, Isaiah chapter uh, 43, verses 1 and 2. Now listen, uh, and this actually describes this event of Joshua and his people um, crossing the river at this time. So it's, you know, God says to Isaiah the prophet, he says this, Do not be afraid. I have called you by my name, and you are mine. So that's Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1. And you know, for all of us who are in between a rock and a hard place, for all of us who feel like we have our back against the wall, I want us to listen to the words of the prophet. Do not fear. Do not be afraid. For I am with you. God is bigger than any problems that we may or may not have. So he says this. Do not be afraid. For I am with you. I am your God. Now he continues through the prophet in verse 2. When you go through the deep waters, I will be with you. We can say something like this. When you're in between a rock and a hard place, I will be with you. God's not going to give up on us just because we're going through a tough time. God's presence, if anything, will increase during these times. And he continues. Uh, when you go through the rivers of difficulty, when your back is against a wall, listen to what he says, you will not drown. You know, God is never going to let the problems of life overtake us because God is bigger than the problems of life. Now, the promise to Joshua and the promise to all of us who have our backs against the wall, the promise to all of us who will find ourselves eventually, if we're not there now, between a rock and a hard place, the promise is this, that when we go through the deep waters of life, when we go through life's toughest challenges, when we, when we um, experience the most difficult situations, God is going to be with us. Now, the perspective that we can take from this is that we don't have to be afraid because God is with us. Now, uh, if we look at the most important commandment in the Bible, Jesus said us to love God and to love other people. Now, that's the most important one. Now, the most common command, the most common promise that we find in the Bible is to not be afraid. Now, God knows this is something that all of us deal with. You know, we're, we're afraid of the past. We're afraid of the future. Some of us are afraid of the present. We're afraid of things we're aware of and afraid of things that we're not aware of. And God says this, do not be afraid. Do not fear, for I am with you. So we've got the promise that God is going to be with us. The perspective is that we're not afraid. And the translation is this. God's job is to see us through our problems. Our job is to cross the river. God's job was to stop the river. Our job is to walk across the river. Now, the people of Israel, they could have stood right on the shore of this river. And all of a sudden, this dam came up from nowhere, and the river just stopped. Now, they could have uh, been so afraid. Well, what if we get part of the way across this river, and what if uh, all of a sudden the river comes down and we're swept away? You know, God will do his part. God will stop the rivers in our life that need to be stopped, but we still have to walk across the river. Now, what we do is, is we believe. What God does is he achieves. You know, God has stopped the water. Our job is to cross. God, God makes the, uh, the walking possible, but we still have to walk. Now, what I want us to do is I want us to look at our rock, and I want us to look at our hard place. Yeah, I want us to uh, look at our back that's against the wall. Now, for some of us, this may mean that we have... Uh, more debt than we have wealth. It may mean that we have more expenses than we do income. And maybe that's the river that God needs to stop in our life so we can start thinking biblically about our finances. You know, I know for um, many of us, it's, it's going to be this. You know, I don't understand somebody. I don't agree with somebody, and that somebody doesn't understand, and they don't agree with me, yet I have to be in a relationship with this person. And because this relationship is dysfunctional, uh, you know, part of my life is hurting. And I'm really struggling because of this. And all of a sudden, understanding and patience becomes the river that God needs to stop and the uh, sandy bottom that we need to walk across. You know, I, I think for a lot of us in this room, I was thinking about this this week, um, I think a lot of us have too many responsibilities and not enough time and energy. You know, God wants to achieve, but we have to believe. You know, and I think for many of us in this room, um, 
we have made mistake after mistake after mistake and the consequences of these mistakes are beginning to pile up on top of each other. And all of a sudden, life is becoming overwhelming. And we're standing at the shore of the river and the river is flooded and it's flowing and there's nothing that we can do to cross it and, and Pharaoh's army is chasing us from behind. And we need God to do something big in our life. And now I want us to look at our unfulfilled dreams. You know, maybe there's a place in this world that we've always wanted to go to, but for one reason or another, we have never been to that place. You know, maybe uh, um, the accomplishment that we're dreaming of, it seems farther and farther away with each passing day. And as we look at our life, it seems like an hourglass at, uh, on a table that's just one grain of sand at a time, uh, you know, flowing away. You know, I think for some of us, um, it, it's, it, it's hope. You know, um, we've defined hope here before as just the dream that tomorrow can be better than today. Now, for some of us, what that means is, you know, today is good. But we want tomorrow to be great. You know, for some of us, today is pretty good. And we want tomorrow to be good. You know, some of us are honest. We have to think to ourselves, well, today is pretty lousy. You know, and I'll be happy if... Uh, Tomorrow is just average. There's not one of us in this room that doesn't want tomorrow to be better than today. And this is where faith comes in. This happens through faith, a gift from God. Now, I want you to listen to these next minute or two because this is the heart of what I want you to hear today. The goal of faith is not to take away our fears. I think it is impossible for any of us, not to have at least some fears in our life. The goal of faith is not to take away our fears, but to leverage those fears into a bolder belief. You know, I think sometimes when we're, uh, when we're trusting in God and, and we still have some fears in our life, that we see God do a great work and all of a sudden we are moved to a bolder level of faith. Now, here's what faith does. Faith will lead us past our fears and move us into God's presence. Now, if we had to choose between one of two places, fear or God's presence, which of the two would we choose? What faith does is move us from our fears into the presence of God. And after a while, what will happen is that we will begin to trust that God will move us to where God wants to move us because God has done this so many times before. You know, think 10 years ago, think 15 years ago, think 5 years ago, think last year when you were in between a rock and a hard place. You know, did you get out of there because uh, you were so good and you were so smart and you were so lucky? Or did we get out of that place because God stopped a river? Did we get out of that place because God made the sun stand dead in its tracks? Now, the little boy had an unrealized dream, and this unrealized dream was that he was going to ride a bike down the street. Now, through the love of his father, that dream became uh, a reality. You know, for those of us with unfulfilled dreams, what I want you to do is think about this. What we think is impossible and improbable today can become possible and probable tomorrow through the help of a God who will be with us. You know, the, the people of Israel, um, you know, they uh, had this river in front of them and this army behind them. And both the army and the, ridge, the river were raging. You know, they had a vision, and the vision was abundance in the promised land. And I think even if their vision uh, wasn't abundance, their vision on the side of the river was just mere survival. And God made it happen. You know, and for those of us who have unfulfilled dreams in front of us, I want us to know that God will help our impossibilities become possible, and God will help our improbabilities become probable. Now, do you believe this? Do you have faith that God can make the impossible possible? Do you believe that God can make the improbable probable? Well, the one thing it takes is faith. You know, belief is a precursor to faith. Faith is complete trust and complete confidence that God can take whatever is improbable and impossible in our lives up to now and make those possibilities and probabilities in the future. Now, the first step in our faith formation is going to be hearing the word of God. It starts with hearing the word of God. I want to go to Romans chapter 10, verse 7. Listen to what Paul says here. 
Paul says, this is the beginning of our faith formation. Paul says, so faith comes from hearing. That is, hearing the good news about Christ. This is where faith comes from. You know, it's nothing that we manufacture. It's no class that we take. Faith comes from hearing, that is, hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. Audacious faith then happens in our life when we place ourselves in environments where we can hear the word of God, where we can sit aside each day and read the scriptures, where we can come to worship on Sunday mornings and we can hear sermons, where we go to small group meetings uh, during the week and we can hear the word of God again. Joshua prayed for the sun uh, to stand still. Because he was aware of the promise that had been made to the people of Israel. And he was aware of the uh, promise that had been made to the people of Israel because he engaged consistently in God's word. I want to go to Joshua chapter 1, verse 7. Um, listen to uh, what uh, God says here to Joshua. And, you know, here, here's the deal. We can't claim God's promises unless we know what God's promises are. Now, here, here's what it says. Uh, be strong and very courageous. Um, be careful to obey all the instructions that Moses gave you. Now, this is another way of saying, hear God's word. Engage yourself in God's word. When he said, be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you, uh, Moses the one, is the one that gave Joshua the Ten Commandments. Moses is the one that God spoke to. So the word that Moses spoke to Joshua was God's word. You know, he heard the word. This was the first step. Um, do not deviate from them, turning either to the left or to the right. Then you will be successful in everything that you do. Now, there's an application to all of us that comes from Joshua chapter 1, verse 7. And that application is this, that success is made possible by obedience. Obedience is made possible by hearing the word of God. Therefore, success can only happen when we hear the word of God. Um, you know, to faithfully pray that the sun will stand still in our lives is to faithfully uh, and consistently hear the word of God. What we do is we increase our exposure to scripture. Uh, we place ourselves uh, where the scripture and sermon are present. We, we prioritize the presence of God in our life. Now, how many of us are doing this on a, on a consistent basis? And then we wonder why God doesn't do uh, miraculous things in our life and why we can't claim the promises. And God says, first, you have to hear my word. Now, this is the place where uh, belief takes hold. And faith begins, is hearing the word of God. Now, the next step um, is speaking the word of God. Now, hearing the word of God is kind of like going into your car and turning the ignition or pushing the button and starting the car. That's hearing God's word. It's step number one. Step number two is speaking God's word. And this is kind of like uh, uh, putting your foot on the brake and uh, turning the car into drive. It's the next step that we take. You know, it's not enough just to read the Bible and get information. What uh, happens has to be transformation. There, there probably isn't a single one of us that came this morning just to get information about what the Bible says. You know, what we have come for this morning is for transformation, for God to do something in us so that tomorrow can be a little bit better than today. Now, uh, I want to just go one verse up. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. Uh, listen to what God tells Joshua. Keep the book of the law always on your lips. Now here we're talking about speaking the word of God. God says, keep the uh, word of the law uh, always on your lips. Listen to what he didn't say. You know, keep the word of the law always on your hearts. You know, keep the word of the law always in your minds. God specifically said to Joshua, keep the word of God always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. This will ensure uh, prosperity and success. So again, the application, um, if we want prosperity and success in our life, what we do is we keep the word of God on our lips. Now, I want to explain this to us. Um, there's bad words. If I would come up to any of you and I would say, why don't you share with me uh, a time in your life when somebody has uh, said something and that really hurt you. Now, within just uh, a few moments, um, within a few seconds, each of you could recall who said those bad words. You could recall the tone of those bad words. You probably remember the place. You even remember the time. Words are very, very power powerful, aren't they? You know, some of us still carry baggage from uh, words that we've heard in the past. People have called us average. They've called us fat. They've called us, uh, they've called us stupid. 
You know, they've called us underachievers. They've called us lazy. They've called us bad. Words are powerful. Bad words, there's good words. If I were to sit down and ask you uh, about a time when someone has affirmed you, when someone has spoken good words to you, just within a few moments, you would smile at me and you would say some words. You'd think of a person, you would remember the time and the place. Good words are powerful. There's bad words, there's good words, and then there's, there's God words. And these are the words that I want you to speak. I want you to speak these words to yourself. I want you to be a preacher. I here this morning am ordaining every one of you to be a preacher of the gospel, and your audience is yourself. You don't have to go to school for way too long like I have to preach these things. And I'm going to give you five examples, okay? Um, if there's someone in here that uh, you know, has made all those mistakes that I talked about earlier, and the consequences of these mistakes are piling up, and you're in between a rock and a hard place, and the decisions in front of you have been so limited by the mistakes that you've made in your past. I want you to say these words to yourself. I am forgiven. There's not a single one of us that's done something so bad that God doesn't forgive us. You know, we can live under the burdens and the pain and the hardship of our past, or we can live as free because God has forgiven us. You don't need a seminary degree. All you got to say is, I'm forgiven. You know, um, if there's a challenge that's in front of you, if there's this uh, dream that's still unfulfilled, you know, if there's a, a big appointment or a big conversation that you have, and there's fear and anxiety because of these things, I want you to say this simple phrase, I am not afraid because God is with me. These are God words. They're powerful words. The next one, um, what if you feel alone? What if you feel unloved? What if you feel nobody cares about you? I want you to say a simple little phrase that is going to be the truest thing that you've ever said. That I am loved. The same God that created the universe, the same God that created the mountains and the ocean and, and the desert and the prairie is the same God who created you. And he loves you. Regardless of what you perceive other people think about you, regardless of what you think about yourself, you are loved. These are God words. And when we say this phrase enough, we're eventually going to start to believe us. And if God loves us, then maybe we can love ourselves. Maybe if we love ourselves, then other people can start loving us too. But it starts with the words that are on our lips. You know, I know when I was talking a little bit ago, I said, you know, maybe you're lousy now and we're just hoping for average tomorrow. Or we're uh, pretty good now and we hope for good tomorrow. Or we're good today and we hope uh, for excellent tomorrow. I want you to say these simple words. My hope is in Jesus. My hope isn't because of who I am. My hope isn't because of what the world is becoming. My hope is because of the God who has created the world. My hope is in Jesus. The last one. Um, you know, I know some of us are on the verge of greatness. I know some of us are about to take the next step, and this is a big, bold step for us, and it's exactly the step that God wants us to take. And the thing I want you to say is that I am resourced. That where there's a vision from God, there is also provision from God. That God's will will not take us, where God's grace and his love and his power will not sustain us. So hearing uh, initiates, speaking activates, and doing the, God word, the word of God, uh, it demonstrates. So what we've done is when we've heard the word of God, we've started the car. When, we've, uh, uh, when we speak the word of God, um, we put the car into drive. When we do the word of God, what happens next is we demonstrate faith. James chapter 1 verse 8 says that faith without works is dead. Faith extends more than just a set of dogma, a dogmatic beliefs. Faith, it, it, it's something that we do, but it's also, uh, it, it's, it's also a, a way of life. Um, faith, faith without works is dead. Now, listen to what faith is not. Authentic faith, uh, audacious faith, is not merely, 
It's not merely a positive mental state. Authentic faith plays out in total obedience. Obedience, as we remember from Joshua, it's a uh, prerequisite for success. As I was thinking about um, doing and demonstrating and obedience, um, I thought of a story from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, verses uh, 25 through 29. And here, Jesus uh, was talking to a bunch of his disciples, and he said, hey, you know, it's late at night. I want you guys to get in this boat and go across this lake, and I'll meet you all over there in the morning. And they kind of objected and said, well, how are you going to get there? And Jesus says, don't worry about that. Just get in the boat, and I'll be over there. And Jesus didn't tell them that a storm was coming. None of them knew that a storm was coming. So these guys are on the boat, and I'm going to pick up in uh, Matthew chapter 14, verse 25. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. Can't say as I blame them for this. Uh, they're out in the lake, it's stormy, and then all of a sudden this guy is walking on a lake. Um, yeah, they're terrified. Again, it was fear. God knows that fear is going to happen in our life. They said it's a ghost, which is probably a pretty good guess. You know, there's not many other people that are walking on lakes. Um, and they cried out again in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Jesus said the exact same thing to the disciples in their fear, in their anxiety, that God said to Joshua in his fear and his anxiety, take courage, do not be afraid. It is me, I am with you. When we have fears and anxiety in our life, remember those words of God, take courage, be strong, do not fear, I am with you. And then Peter says in verse 28, uh, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Then in verse 29, come, uh, Jesus said. Then Peter got down out of the boat. He walked on the water, and he came toward Jesus. Now, this, these four little verses here, uh, or five little verses, they give us this uh, faith formation process from beginning to end. You know, Peter heard the word of God. You know, uh, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. The next step that Peter did is he spoke. The words were on his lips. He said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come on the water. Now, um, if we just stop the story there, uh, this wouldn't be a story that we teach our kids in Sunday school. You know, it's not a lesson that I would uh, share with you on Sunday mornings. Up to this point, this is just an interesting conversation. Jesus is out in the water. Uh, Peter acknowledges it. But what happens in 29 is the gospel is done. Now, imagine if we go out to our car and we start the car and we put it in drive. And let's assume that we're against one of those uh, uh, little curbs. We're not going to go anywhere. It's pointless. And sometimes I think just hearing and speaking the word of God, uh, it, it's, it's, it's 20% of the 100% that we have to do. The biggest and the most important step is doing and demonstrating and acting the word of God in our lives and the lives of others. So Peter pushed the gas pedal in verse 29. Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water and he came to Jesus. Now, there's an essential part of the story you have to hear. Peter got out of the boat. And the minute that Peter put his entire faith, his entire trust in God, is the exact same moment that God did something in Peter's life. Something that God has never done before or since then. God allowed Peter to walk on water. But he only did this when Peter demonstrated 100% trust and faith in Jesus. Peter stepped out of the boat into the stormy waters, and he stepped onto the water. And the moment that he stepped onto that water is the moment that God did something special in his life and allowed him to walk on the water. Now, you know, here, here's the deal. It is time for us to get out of the boat. In your life, it is time to get out of the boat. The boat is not where God intends us to live. God intends for us to live outside the boat. God has made us a promise. We believe in the promise. That's only 20%. The last part is it's time to claim the promise that God has given to us. You know, two weeks ago I talked about let's start to develop a biblical vision for our life. Now I know that some of you already know what this biblical vision is or you know what part of this biblical vision is. You know, some of us in the last two weeks may have made some progress toward uh, discerning what that vision is and some of us may not be quite there yet. But God wants us to achieve the vision that he has for our lives. God wants us to achieve the dreams that he has for our life. Now, some of us, uh, we got our back against the wall. 
Some of us are in between a, a rock and a hard place. We look at option A and option B and option C and none of them are that great. God says, do not be afraid. Take courage. I am with you. You know, to all of us that have dreams that are unfulfilled, to all of us that have uh, visions that haven't come true yet, God says, I'm with you. Take courage. Don't be afraid. Together, we are going to do this. So let's go to God and let us pray.